Good evening from India. This is Devavrat. I am a, a lawyer practicing in Supreme Court and a mediator. I welcome you all. I welcome Ms. Archana Madekar, our guest speaker. I welcome everybody the organization, Mr. Santanam, Mr. J.M. Krishna, Mr. Rakesh Khanna, all the senior advocates here in the practice in the Supreme Court. I am uh, just want to know if I'm uh, audible to everybody properly. Yeah. Mr. Santanam, is it, is it fine? I, I think uh, there was some issue. It's fine. It's fine. You can go ahead. It's fine. All right. So today's uh, topic, as you all know, is historical perspective of dispute resolution and uh, development of legal systems and culture. So Ms. Archana will be giving her presentation on these subjects. Uh, in India, dispute resolution, um, whoever was familiar with India, I think comes Arjuna is also familiar, having roots in India, that uh, we have a system, we had a system of panchayat, which was kind of uh, a group of village elders who used to decide the issues of the villages. From there, we started. That's the route we find, uh, which is very old in India, of alternative disputes resolution system. Uh, later on, it developed, and uh, I would uh, like to quote uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who has used the tool of mediation in a big way in uh, many of his uh, in areas, whether it was in South Africa or in India, in solving the dispute, religious disputes also, and uh, many other contentious issues. I would just like to quote him. Uh, after one dispute resolution, what he has said. He has said, and I quote, that my joy is, was boundless. After this, he uh, uh, successfully mediated this uh, dispute. He said that my joy was boundless. I had learned the true practice of law. I had learned to find out the better side of the human nature and to enter men's heart. I realized that the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties, even as ender. The lesson was so indelibly burnt into me that a large part of my time during the 20 years of my practice as a lawyer was occupied in bringing about private compromises of hundreds of cases. I lost nothing thereby, not even money, certainly not my soul. So with these words, I just uh, like to start what happened in India. I mean, our, how do we develop this ADR system from the very beginning and how it entered our statute. So uh, I just mentioned about the panchayat system. The first mention of ADR we find in the Bengal resolution of arbitration and uh, this uh, rules and the regulations introduced in 1772 by the Britishers in India uh, who were rulers then the colonial uh, past we had so in 1772 78 and uh, thereafter uh, in uh, 1781 also there was regulations to encourage the arbitration indian arbitration act was passed only in 1889 it was reintroduced in uh, 1940 and thereafter it was actually amended and the new law was brought only in 1996 so which was a path-breaking uh, statutory law in alternative dispute resolution in India. And uh, thereafter, we started introducing different forms of ADR in our country, uh, uh, which actually got impetus when we introduced 1982 Lok Adalat Act. 
and thereafter the Legal Services Ab uh, Authorities Act 1987. Lok Adalat received this statutory uh, uh, status. Now, what Lok Adalat means in English is uh, the courts of people. So, what we uh, do here in Lok Adalat, we still have it that uh, we organize uh, a Lok Adalat. Of course, of people which is, uh, listing some 100, 200, 1000 cases together of similar kind. And uh, uh, we call a high court judge or a magistrate or a district or court judge. He sits and uh, kind of do the arbitration and mediation and tries to sort out the similar nature of cases in one go. Sometimes thousands of cases are disposed of in a single day. So that's how the Lok Adala system is successful in India in a big way. It's still happening. It's happening all over the country. And uh, uh, as you know, that Indian courts are overdone with the backlog of cases. We have uh, millions of cases pending in our courts, right from the trial court to the high court and the Supreme Court. And uh, the, our courts have a very difficult time dealing with the cases and therefore the ADR is a necessity in today's uh, uh, scenario in our country and therefore our uh, national law commission has recommended that ADR should be a primary mode of disputes resolution system than that the court system which we have today which is still you know functioning on the common law system which we inherited from, inherited from the Britishers. And uh, now uh, thereafter we have uh, introduced this media system in a big way in our family courts. And this is the, uh, the, the dispute resolution system of our Marriages Act. We have separate Marriages Act of uh, different religions. We have Hindu Marriage Acts, we have uh, Muslim Marriage Acts and we have Special Marriage Acts. Special Marriage Act takes care of any other inter-religion marriage and everything. So we amended these sections to introduce the ADR from time to time uh, uh, in the Hindu Marriage Act 22, 23, subsection 2, 23, it was uh, introduced later on. And uh, that, uh, therefore, we that's how we have introduced different ADR system in India in our... Uh, family laws, because in our country, uh, mediation is very successful tool in dispute, in uh, resolving this uh, family disputes. Our dockets in the trial courts are full of family cases and the matrimonial disputes and the, the, the mediation and reconciliation system has been largely successful in resolving these disputes like in many other parts of the world. Now, uh, because of this judicial delay, the law commission of the National Law Commission, our uh, uh, primary body, which is responsible for framing the laws and recommending the laws, like in many other countries, has actually put ADR as a primary source of dispute resolution and recommended the Amendment of CPC, which is a primary uh, code of civil procedure, which was first recommended in 1999. Thereafter, uh, in the Legal Services Act was also introduced, and uh, again it was uh, amended in 97. And uh, uh, the Legal uh, Services Act was reintroduced in 2002. So that's how we have developed through the ages, and. Uh, Today, the ADR is a primary system of dispute resolution and, uh, and mediation uh, where we work in Supreme Court, we see every single day the need of ADR and how it is important in dispute resolution. The Supreme Court has stressed the need of ADR time and again, and we have a very uh, 
celebrated case of ONGC versus collector of central uh, central excise, where there was a dispute between the public sector undertaking and the government of India involving principles to be examined at the highest government level. Court held that should not be brought before the court, wasting public money and time, and therefore it should be uh, resolved by the ADR. This was the Supreme Court. ONGC versus collector of central excise has been quoted and re-quoted. About for the government litigation, because in India the government is one of the biggest litigator. There was a, another case uh, which is uh, also a very famous case called Chief Conservator of Forest versus Collector. The, the Supreme Court said that it was that state union government must involve a mechanism for resolving interdepartmental controversies. Dispute between the government depo uh, de government department cannot be contested in court. In Punjab and Sindh Bank versus Allahabad Bank, it was by the direction of the Supreme Court that the government to set up a committee to monitor dispute between government departments and public sector in taking, making it clear that the machinery contemplated is only to ensure that no litigation comes to the court without the parties having had the opportunity of conciliation before an in-house committee. Now, these there are several other cases also which came from time to time, and the Supreme Court and the, the different high courts sent it back to uh, have them resolved by way of uh, alternate dispute resolution system rather than by the mandate of the court. Now, uh, I have a very interesting quote by uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, before I introduce uh, Madam. Archana to give her presentation and uh, where he has said that, uh, and I quote, persuade your neighbors to compromise whether you, whenever you can, point out them how the nominal winner is often a real loser in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has the superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. So I think uh, it is very wise statement by a great statesman of all times. Now, uh, I'll make some endeavor to introduce our speaker, uh, Archana Madekar, who has a very long time in mediation of about 25 years she has spent. As a mediator, she has the Indian uh, roots, but she migrated to Canada and uh, from there she, she is, has, has expertise in as a mediator, ar arbitrator practicing in Toronto, Canada. She is a negotiator, negotiator trained at Harvard School of Law with special focus on leveraging power of emotions or negotiation table. She is an educator teaching at the York University Family Mediation Program. She is a roster mediator with various court connected family mediation programs funded by the Ministry of Attorney General. As I said, she brings over more than 25 years of international experience in the field of dispute resolution. Archana's conflict resolution work is focused on issues of screening for power imbalances, gender based violence, and impact of abuse of children with use of trauma informed and intersectional framework. Work. She specializes in process designing and believes in linguistically, culturally informed approach in crucial of, of for family navigating in any dispute resolution process. Archana is a member of the leadership team of the United Nations Working Group of an International NGO Mediators Beyond Borders International, which has consultative status with the UN. She currently serves as a board member of of the International Organization Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, Ontario. Archana is also a co-author of a book, Domestic Violence in Immigrant Communities, Case Studies, containing 15 case studies developed as free online material. That's very commendable. 
She is currently involved in a research project focused on impacts of experiencing or witnessing domestic violence in childhood perspective of radicalized immigrant youth, Archana is a public speaker and facilitator of international training and workshop on leadership and negotiation. Mediation and peace building and, and creative problem solving process. Now I will come to Archana's award. She has got the award of distinctions include in volunteering service award from Ontario Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration and the award for the champion for social justice presented by Indus Community of Services of Peel and recognition as trailblazer in social justice by Salco. Archana lives in Toronto, Canada with her husband and uh, he has a son and also a family dog, Emily or Ellie. <laughs> so so uh, that, that's about uh, Archana. Now it's over to you, Archana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, I would like to begin with thanking uh, the Nivaran team for this wonderful opportunity uh, to bring all of us together from different parts of the world. And I can see that people have joined from various parts of India and even other parts of the world. I, I guess Australia and Turkey, as far as I can see, maybe from other parts as well. So welcome to everyone. And uh, I would uh, invite all of you to share in chat your names and where you are joining from. And uh, it would be wonderful to know who has joined from where and is sharing this wonderful virtual space together. So before any further ado, I would take a dive into the topic that I would be covering today. And uh, I'm going to try sharing my screen. I have PowerPoint presentation. So the intention is to uh, first share some of my ideas and then we'll open it up for discussion. I hope that it's okay um, if we do it this way. And uh, Devabrat and Jitendra and Santan have uh, agreed to take a look at the chat and they would uh, facilitate the question and answers towards the end of the presentation. Okay, do you see my screen properly? We can see. Okay, wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> so the topic for today is, uh, I would summarize that it's uh, evolution of dispute resolution and culture. So that's the crux of how I looked at this topic and that's how I would like to approach it. Um, before I go into the details, this is the first session of the series of sessions. And sometimes it's wonderful to take a pause and think about what are the learning values. And particularly for today's session, I wanna bring four learning values. And those are, we have to take risks, be courageous. And to be courageous, we have to leave our comfort zone and try something new, learn something new, open up our minds and let the new ideas come into our world. Be curious to explore opportunities and opportunities to build your skills as dispute resolution professionals. But even as you learn professionally, you apply that knowledge to your personal life as well. Third one is to be responsible. Take ownership of whatever you do, the path you choose, and the most important thing, and that's why I value all of you who have registered for the event and want to participate in this virtual space, to
to bring your reflective understanding based on prior knowledge. What we need in dispute resolution is all of your experience, all of your understanding of the root causes of conflict and to find creative solutions. So with these learning values, I would like to start with this adage. It's French, but of course I'm going to speak about it in English. It says, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. It means that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think you will all agree with me that if we look at the history and we trace the evolution of dispute resolution, a lot of things seem to have changed, but a lot has not changed. And the reason for that is the core principles and values of dispute resolution and fairness in different ways remains the same. But what has changed is how we deliver that, how the system is responding and what is the demand from the ground from people. At the core of dispute resolution is fairness, people feeling satisfied about the solution that they develop together. Is there an opportunity in the dispute resolution system for them to do that? So rather than taking the stock of the past historical practices in various parts of the world, I thought that I would focus on those core principles or values and then explore the developments <clears throat> of the diverse use of dispute resolution processes. And there is re-emergence of the formal and informal adjudication processes being used in a different format that is new. And that's what we have to tap into. There is a new culture of public participation in dispute resolution. There is more collaborative dialogue that people are demanding when it comes to their own disputes. So let's tap into this new culture of DR. I'm just going to use DR as a short form for dispute resolution. So I would like to review today the historical legal perspectives of DR. It's a quite large topic. So it can go back to the inception of dispute resolution systems and it could be retrospective. But what I would like to do is to take the prospective approach to see where it's going, where we stand today, based on some of the recent history. And I appreciate Devrat uh, tapping into more further uh, historical perspective that goes deeper into the past, which touch based on uh, how panchayats were used, how elders or panch uh, would actually allow people to participate in dispute resolution processes and the impact of colonization and how it has impacted the dispute resolution landscape in India. So I wanna build further on that. If we want to look at dispute resolution, this focus of the presentation would be on some of the aspects of last few decades. I would like to review the new culture of belonging. And there are various movements in dispute resolution, which are transforming roles of various professionals, lawyers, judges, and other professionals who are brought into the arena of dispute resolution, <clears throat> who has not been traditionally part of all of that. So at the center of everything is a human being. And I would like to take the human-centric approach in dispute resolution. It connects back to the intellectual evolution of us as human spirit. As our spirit changes, as our understanding of the intellectuality of finding solutions of the problems, how we define problems, as it changes, 
the dispute resolution experience of people and the approaches of the sector has to change. And I would like to focus, if there is any takeaway from my presentation today, is one, which is to understand the fluidity and relationship of various dispute resolution processes with each other. They're not compartmentalized. Mediation, arbitration, litigation, these are all forms of dispute resolution, but they should be permeable. They should breathe in and out of each other. The focus has to be the human being, not the process. The focus has to be problem solving, not the problem. And the focus has to be not the forum, it has to be where people can find the justice that they understand to be the justice. So the evolution of DR experience and the approaches of the sector are changing because that's how people are feeling all across the globe. We have all seen at the very beginning of the humanity setting in that might was right. And then there were some formal methods of resolving the disputes or problems of the people, such as litigation, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, we started naming it. What's underlying that formality of processes is to desire by the humanity to live in harmony, to have relationships with a family, their friends and their community. But the paradox of peace is that it's a human condition that to achieve peace, we have to fight for it. And people who participate in various processes, if you are a mediator who are participating in your mediation at the table, they have to have the sense of justice. And we have, we have all discussed across various constitutions or other documents which formalized what justice means and how to achieve that. There are two core concepts. One is equality and other is equity. But before I speak about those, I think in today's world, the push is to have two core requirements from the dispute resolution system. One is inclusion and other is belonging. There is a wonderful book uh, by Ruchika Tulshian who has written about being inclusive on purpose. We are not born with inclusion. We are conditioned differently as we socialize. It takes awareness, intention, and regular practice to be inclusive. And I invite all of you to consider the spaces that you're working in and see if they're inclusive enough from various angles or not. Belonging is another important concept. There were people who were not at the table when the systems were designed. What's about the voice of those people in dispute resolution? How evaluative the processes were defined when many people didn't have seat at the table. And that's where mediation allows the path to equity. It's consistent inclusion. It depends on dismantling some of the system barriers for the historically marginalized communities and people whose voices were not heard when the systems were designed. Dignity is another concept. People who are participating in various forms of dispute resolution, they have to feel that, yes, this is my process, and I'm being treated fairly. I feel that I'm being respected in the process. It's a very important aspect. It's valuable for people who are participating. Mediation and many other hybrid processes create the climate of belonging where the participants feel that they have respect to their human dignity. And that's the basic fundamental thing that people sometimes thrive for. 
So the principle of equity and equality, looking at equality, of course, we know that it assumes that everyone is the same. So equality is an act of treating everyone equal, irrespective of their differences, as you can see in this wonderful uh, picture at the left-hand side. If we look at equity, it goes beyond treating everyone the same. It provides support to the disadvantaged. You can see the person who has a smaller ladder and bigger ladder, and the person who is shorter gets the bigger ladder to get the fruit so that they both have conducive process to reach their end goal. And that's equity. I love this small caricature, which allows us to see the bigger picture of equality and justice. So equality is definitely necessary for dispute resolution, but it's not sufficient for justice. So then what does justice mean? As I talked about inclusion and belonging and dignity, looking at justice, Justice could mean different things to different people. To the core of it, justice is the concept of fairness. We are living in a historical moment. Where I see it from, we are at the crossroads. The current trend is moving away from the binary world of black and white in dispute resolution system. There is push for sustainable, creative, problem solving that provides meaningful access to justice to people. Rather than fitting the first to the forum, the forums are evolving. The roles of professionals are changing and there is a huge reframing of culture in dispute resolution that's focusing on what justice means. And as we have still seen through COVID, COVID has created a lot of disruption in human life. In the words of Esther Perel, the challenge is to stay grounded when the ground is shifting. And we feel it all across the world. This pandemic has caused further strain on relationships, systems, but it has also taught us how to adapt and how to evolve and how to survive and thrive. So as we are curious about justice or access to justice, from the perspective of development of legal systems and processes, it's important for participants to participate in the process meaningfully with dis dignity, respect, and the core of it is the right of self-determination. It's at the heart of the justice or access to justice as well. And of course, the cost and time effective nature of any dispute resolution process is very important for people. So now let's look at some current trends of DR and then look back in historical perspective and see what's changed and what's not changed. Or what's changed is just evolved. It just feels like we are in new era, but a lot of things have not changed. So there are some observations about current trends. There is increase in use of various alternative dispute resolution processes. And of course, there is a controversy whether that should be an alternative or not. But let's use the term ADR or alternative dispute resolution processes to see that other than litigation process, because over the period of time, litigation has consumed the space uh, more than what people really wanted it to be. There is increased use of non-binding, non-evaluative DR processes, either in place of litigation, as I said, in ADR, or in tandem with litigation. Together, there are court-attached mediation or other processes being offered. And that's, that has changed how there is delivery of justice. Another aspect is the private and public justice systems, both are significantly impacted. So it's not just because people who do not have resources or funds 
to have private dispute resolution are choosing another way of dealing with it. Both the systems are changing significantly. So in turn, there is an impact on practice of law for professionals, all of us who are participating traditionally as primary uh, focus on dispute resolution professionals. But the parties are getting more involved in dispute resolution. There is a public demand. There is a change of culture that people want to participate more than before. Another impact is there is growing trend that it's now go beyond adjudication and consider spectrum of dispute resolution processes. And I would touch base on some of the aspects of the spectrum and how it looks like. And the most important thing, which allowed all of us to survive during the pandemic and how we are connecting today is the emergence and sustaining nature now of ODR or online dispute resolution or computer-based services. I would not have enough time to touch on that today, but various speakers after me are going to cover all these trends in many other aspects as well. So now I would like to look at the frameworks of disputing. There are three approaches to resolving conflict. URI, URI was one of the principal people who studied conflict resolution in Western part of the world. And he has suggested three bases of resolving conflict, power, rights and interests. And see, things have not really changed from the legal historical perspective and today, all these three things seem to dominate the dispute resolution world. So looking at power, there are two concepts. One is power over and the other is power with. So power over is ability to get another person to do something that they would not otherwise do, which happens usually in forms of adversarial litigation type of processes. Power with is jointly developed non-coercive sharing of power, such as in mediation. The beauty of power is power shifts. Sometimes it could be subtle. So even the person who does not have power who feels to be the weaker one might show with a mighty force of power at your mediation table. If we look at the right-based adversarial system, the fighting of parties for legal rights and redressal is at the core of it. And it's designed to limit exercise of power and judges follow the legal framework. But the rights are based on power. And the powerful party usually wins in the court, in the adversarial system. So it creates barriers for vulnerable people in that system. There could be various entitlements of parties and there are various categories of rights. But then looking at interests, there could be substantive, procedural, or emotional, psychological interests. So in interest-based processes, such as mediation or um, IDR, which is indigenous dispute resolution processes, such as talking circles, uh, healing circles, there are valuable things that parties can do, which is not available otherwise in other processes. One, it's, as I said, it offers more inclusivity in the process. Second, it can be designed suitable for the needs of the parties. Third thing is it allows deeper level of conflict to emerge. It depends how skillful you are and how facilitated conversations allow the parties to take a deep dive into the conflict. People can express their emotions openly. That's needed. A lot of times that's what people need before they come to their part of the brain that starts resolving the conflict. They have to discuss their interests and take responsibility for the harm or injury caused by the other. 
and creative problem solving is led by parties themselves. All, of, all across the globe, the reason the justice system is getting clogged is people are not satisfied. There is no buy-in. One party wins, the other appeals. The other appeals that decision and goes to the next level. People keep on coming back to the system because the solutions are not sustainable. There, there is no voice of people whose problems are being resolved. And mediation offers an opportunity for the parties to learn from each other uh, and transform. Mediation is the only process that allows people to transform and understand the, re the root causes of what's actually at stake. The new mediation system, and of course, I would say that new dispute resolution system is socio-legally conscious as well. So <clears throat> before there was codification of laws, the ethics and morals were the frameworks of resolving disputes. And that's true all across the globe. Morals were the personal values that people learned at home, at school, in community. It was through their religious, cultural, or social communities, gatherings, and how they understood what's moral, what's immoral, and that decided what's right, what's wrong. Then there is the concept of ethics, which is set of moral principles, which was provided by the external sources. For example, the code of conduct. What the code of conduct says, that becomes ethical. And then further to that is rule of law, which codified everything, defined what's right and wrong. And for whatever is wrong, there is punishment. And then there is decision of what's right and wrong. A person could follow ethical code that conflicts with their personal value. And a person could violate the ethical code to maintain a moral code. So the, it's complicated. It's not as simple as just saying that you should follow the law because sometimes it does not really sit well with understanding of people. And sometimes we need the might of law. And that's why some types of disputes require the forum of litigation, but some litigations do not belong in that space and need to be using the framework of what's right and wrong, which is not necessarily based on the law. The ethics and integrity is an interesting aspect as well. Ethics is, of course, as we said, doing right thing when people are watching. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. And that's your conscience, people's understanding of what's right and wrong, what you present in evidence of the court, who are your witnesses, it doesn't matter. You know inside you as a party, what's right and wrong, what, we, what have you done to the other party and what needs to be corrected. But that understanding is not brought into the adversarial system and that's one of the limits of law. Mediation goes above and beyond legal rights framework. It opens up the infinite possibility and unlocks the potential of resolution. So there are various frames, frameworks of disputing, which has not changed over the course of centuries. So the moral and ethical frameworks definitely have not changed. The cultural framework has not really changed. There has been shifting, dismantling of cultural frameworks, but people have been able to hold on to their cultural aspects their cultural identities that I will go deeper into in a minute, which is all different than the legal framework that we have known as the primary source in recent years. So looking back into the history, the core concept has remained to be impartiality being important for justice, being even-handed, fair-mindedness of the third party neutral or a judge, or whoever is the decision maker. A principle of justice holding that decision should be based on objective criteria, which is what's evidence, what's law, 
and there should be no prejudice or preferences. It's also known as rule of natural justice. And it's very interesting that impartiality is still the core of everything that we do in dispute resolution. To me personally, as a mediator, balancing the power has been a challenge. You will see that the speakers after me are going to focus on that aspect. What's the role of a mediator? But one concept, my mediation guru who lives in US, his name is Ken Cloak. You might have heard about his book, Mediating Dangerously. He coined the term omnipartial. You are partial towards each and every participant of the dispute. That allows you to make it equitable. The ladder, if needed, to reach where they need to, whatever their vulnerabilities are, you as a designer of the process provide the supports needed. If someone does not know the language, you provide interpreter. If someone does not understand the perspectives of disputing, you bring that support in. And that's possible in still being impartial, but allowing everyone to fully participate. Neutrality is another big concept. It's not changed. The tendency not to take sides in a conflict. It doesn't mean that neutral means that you are not taking any action. It's really crucial to understand that bias or not being appearing to be biased has always remained the core. Even as a mediator or designer of the process, the parties would feel if your biases are kicking in and then they will feel that it's not a fair process for them. So there are implications for legal framework since last at least two decades where the legal framework does not satisfy people sometimes because it does not take the interests or culture into account of the individual parties who are participating. The disputes have to fit within the legal parameters, such as the cause of action. There has to be proof that what has been really the party's perspective and they advocate for their own position for that. And the outcome is based on evidence applying the law to the facts. And the result is what we call it as distributive rather than integrative. It divides people, it divides the pie on the table, it gives each of them piece of it. Rather than integrating it, bringing them together, having the, co the collective understanding of what had been wronged, bringing people together because they are going to live in the same family sometimes, within the same community, in the same country, and they are not polarized. It's important to see that justice weaves all through this needs of the parties. And that's where we look at the role of culture in dispute resolution. Culture refers to customary beliefs, social norms, racial, religious, or social groups. A person's country of origin can influence that individual's culture, but it's not the only influence on their cultural identity. Cultural identity is shaped by religious beliefs, ethnicity, gender identity, social class interests, many things. This is my favorite culture iceberg. You might have seen it before. If we look at the surface of it, food, fashion, festivals, games, music, language, we all accept it, it's very easy. And as an immigrant, I actually saw how people would accept saris and samosas and tablas. But then going deeper into the culture, understanding how parties communicate, what's their attitude towards problem solving, rules, elders, family, how they cooperate with each other, how is decision making made? All of that is the deep culture. And to understand all of that is the key for any dispute resolution professional. So what's culture? Culture is the communal portion of our identity. 
It's interesting that we all have multiple cultural identities. Sometimes they could even be conflicting. Culture is not static. It's always negotiated. Constance Backhouse, my, my favorite legal history author in Canada, she says culture has long tentacles. It's deep-rooted and it's deep-rooted in our psyches and it's actually passed on from generation to generation. So we have to be culturally sensitive or competent as dispute resolution professionals because cultural competence means that our capacity to navigate into various aspects of people's identities in a sensitive manner. We call it as the three aspects of dispute, naming, framing, and claiming. I would modify that a bit and say how naming, framing, and taming is brought in by a skillful dispute resolution professional is important. There is an art of meaning making. There is art of understanding people's worldview. What are their identities? What are their roles? A skillful dispute resolution professional would remove the cultural barriers for the parties to participate in these processes. So looking at some of the theory and practice of dispute system design. So the goal of dispute system design or DSD, and I'm sure you have all heard about this science of designing justice. It's fascinating. It's how do we design justice, either through rights-based or interest-based process, where you use legal uh, framework, third-party decision maker, or you use non-binding, non-evaluative, interest-focused, the vibe in its position approach. The system designs how justice looks like. So as designers of process, that's us. We have to define problem. We have to have needs assessment. We have to understand the objectives and outcomes with the parties and decide the process. What process is important and appropriate for the clients and educating the clients about it. We have a huge role. And that's not changed in a historical way. And that's how understanding the access to justice becomes really crucial. Access to justice is basically having time sensitive resolution of the problems which would not escalate further. The new understanding of access to justice includes selecting appropriate process to resolve their problem. Mixing and matching the continuum of processes, which is the need of the parties. This is a continuum of dispute resolution processes. A very simple visual, as you can see that the dispute resolution processes such as prevention, negotiation, facilitation, mediation, arbitration, litigation, you can see the control of the parties being more to less. It's command consensus model. It's a continuum. It's the processes are not fully exclusive. We have been traditionally using them exclusively. It's time to change. It's time to be courageous. It's time to be creative because people are hurting, particularly after the pandemic, there are clogging of the systems everywhere. So sticking with one process where the parties would not have opportunity to be presenting their case is not gonna work. So one process could blend into another. There is a huge shift on the ground yeah. to mix and match processes. We have been using mediation and arbitration, which we call it as MEDARP. We're using the court attached mediation systems. These hybrid processes are going to expand in use as we go forward. And his, here is why. Whatever allows the conflict management to address the situation is important. There is too much of focus on settlement where the only thing that's addressed is behavior. 
we have to look at the conflict resolution going to the root causes. And if possible, go beyond resolution and transform the conflict, change the parties one party at a time. And this could actually, this adaptation of the system to do that is important. There is a huge growth in consensual dispute resolution processes. There is more degree of participation of control for the parties, their self-determination, openness to public to have their mind expressed, which is changing the culture in a way that's impacting a lot of changes. There is a user experience of dispute resolution system, and I'm speaking about it very objectively. This is not how we usually speak. But its impact is there is a change in how the users are experiencing the courts or even the court-based processes. There is an evolution of various programs that identify the conclusions and there is one consistent theme. There is high client satisfaction with mediation, with similar processes where people have as you can see more command on the process and more voice. Their capacity to settle early depends on the length of time, how much time they spend with each other, with the third party facilitator, which is really important for them to vent their emotions and see objectively. In turn, it reduces cost and there is a structure of these various court attached mediation or other programs that is being pushed in the sense of demand from the public, which is transforming the roles of judges or dispute resolution professionals or even lawyers. Because what's important is the intersectionality. And this concept has changed my understanding of things, my understanding of privileges and operations of people, there are multiple identities of people which place them or plots them in various places in the society. And people with those interlocking and intersecting access identities would come at your process resolution and you are catering to them. So there are various values of mediation and there are traditional evaluative methods even those are changing. The push is for the judges to shift towards more facilitative and dispute resolution, more holistic interventions, multidisciplinary approaches, and meaning of legal problems resolution using various different tools. So there is a change in public culture and the values of mediation are to see more consensual alternative aspects that identify their culture. The private dispute resolution is accepting more mediation, arbitration, or collaborative law spaces. There is rise on therapeutic jurisprudence amongst the judiciary, and there is a mindfulness movement. So the value of conflict sometimes is seen as negative. We have to understand that the disruption of conflict is sometimes an opportunity for growth and change. There is aspect of being restorative and being restorative in aspect is really crucial in the day where there has been a lot of toll on people's mental health and well-being. We have to talk about justice in understanding individuals' social positions as we saw in the intersectional aspect, understanding their privileges and challenges in a unique way. There has been a lot of challenges due to the intergenerational nature of what people have suffered. And in that framework, there has to happen something which goes beyond the legal redressal. There has to be healing. We, we have to understand that the 20th, 21st century clients, 
are demanding and are expect, expecting the dispute resolution professionals to be more creative. There are type of changes that are producing the demand for understanding the education aspect of dispute resolution. People have access to internet. There are various causes for conflict. As a lawyer, as a conflict resolution practitioner, if you are stuck with the old ideas, people are not satisfied. They need new ideas and solutions that would stay with their understanding of justice and their understanding of wrongdoing by the others. Restorative justice is a way of responding in a different way that focuses not really blaming, but bringing remedies. This is a justice that would allow people to heal. And our legal systems have to go closer to the aim of healing people's problems. We need a huge shift, a change, and I would like to quote Einstein who said that we cannot solve prob the old problems using the same kind of thinking when, we were when they were created. And the most important thing is we don't see the world as it is. We see the things as we are. So being reflective and changing the dispute resolution professionals approach is the key. The one who possesses the skill of creativity, collaboration, who understands emotions, social intelligence, and the one who accepts change. So with that, I would like to stop sharing and I would hand over to Devrat and... Uh... Prashan Mahajan. Yeah. Thank you. You can start Devrat. Very much. Archana, madam, for that uh, valuable presentation and talking about giving us new ideas about what is what are the values of mediation and uh, the value of conflict and uh, which has to be something positive and uh, talking about an opportunity for growth and change and talking about the restorative justice, the ideas which were not very, we were not very familiar with, and uh, uh, talking about so many new avenues of ADR and uh, equipping us with the new ideas of conflict management and conflict settlement. With uh, these words, I would uh, open the floor for questions. And uh, Dr. Krishn Mahajan, who is a lawyer and an uh, academician and uh, uh, professor, he would join me in uh, this interactive session. So uh, can we have questions uh, from the everyone, whoever's uh, interested? in asking a question. So first question I have uh, is I'm taking we have too many questions now actually. So uh, first question I'm uh, having to uh, ask this Archana is uh, from Mr. Harun. He's asking is ADR applicable to human rights dispute resolution where there state acts as a party, are there any examples for this in outer countries, madam? That's a wonderful question. Um, I would actually share that the UN platform, United Nations platform, where all the nations of the world, most of the nations, I would say, have come together and we have all focused on Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And if you look at SDG 16, it talks about the justice and, and basically understanding of the framework of what is the resolution 
uh, from the global perspective, but the frameworks used in each of the country to make the justice systems more transparent, more focused on resolution that takes into consideration the alternative dispute resolution processes such as mediation. And yes, there has been a lot of work done from the human rights perspective and bringing the human rights framework into the ADR aspects and ADR aspect into human rights spaces. So internationally, there is a shift in focusing on these processes and implementation will come slowly as we don't necessarily see it. There are ADR processes being used in track one, track two, track 1.5, which is formal and informal processes for even building peace, where there are different talks within the human rights for a framework, where there are formal diplomats participating and bringing in more actors other than state actors, or there are informal mediations uh, being conducted as various other forms that I couldn't talk about today, uh, which brings people's voices and collaboration into human rights spaces as well. Debra? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mahajan, would you like to ask uh, anything? Uh, Ma'am, uh, you have opened, a, opened an ocean of possibilities and uh, many thanks for that. Uh, the issue that arises is that uh, does the economic uh, structure of the parties, it doesn't matter which parties, uh, determine, determine the course of dispute resolution? So wonderful question again. I think that when we talk about equity, and that's why I, I wanted to start from the point of equity and opportunities to have problem solving for people irrespective of their ability to put in resources. And the changes that I was talking about are actually happening in both private and public sector. When people don't have resources to privately hire an arbitrator, how does the publicly funded system respond to their needs of not necessarily litigating, but then having other approaches available to them? And that's why these court connected uh, mediation programs or many other collaborative spaces being created within the adversarial system is changing, it's shifting. So the one takeaway that I really wanted all of you to take from my presentation today is we have understood the importance of the processes that allow people to find their own solutions. Even if they are in litigation process where most of the times people who do not have financial resources, as you have asked, would traditionally go to because they don't have any other options available. Can we transform those places? Can we bring these opportunities as code connected programs of educating public, allowing them to narrow or resolve their issues through third party professionals who are not judges, who would bring facilitative aspect for which it could be state funded. And there are actually many parts of the world and I think including India that the state funded uh, aspects of alternative dispute resolutions are being brought into the litigation spaces. So people who do not have means would still have access to this kind of justice, which heals, which allows them to take more control of the outcome. The, thank you very much. The, there's just a supplementary to this. Uh, do you think it's time that mediation went to the parties instead of the parties coming to mediation? In ideal world, yes. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and we should all. In India, it's crucial because uh, people don't even have transport money to come to the court. And that's where I think the aspect of ODR comes into play. Yeah. And it's huge because it would allow people 
to join in into the dispute resolution, even the talking circles, of course, not in the, in the way of uh, traditionally sitting in circle, but participating fully by whatever technology facilitated means becomes a huge aspect. There are a lot of things that can be done with the use of technology. And I know that India is huge. Everyone has at least one cell phone and people can do wonders with that. And, and I think that it's just about being creative to use these technologies to make things accessible for people who do not have modes of transportation. And we have successfully done it since last two years through the pandemic. We struggled through initial year or so, but now we have adapted and people have been participating in this virtual spaces very productively. Thank you. Devrat, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that illuminating answer. I have a very interesting question from Mandari Parada Sarji. Uh, he is asking, uh, why cannot the judges in court follow these concepts, the concept which we have just elaborated, and process to render equitable and distributive justice to the parties? So I think that rather, I would like to reframe uh, the question a little bit. There have been a uh, very tight space for spaces based on the process. People think that... Do you see someone? Can everyone mute themselves, please? So litigation has traditionally been the system where the legal framework was followed. And some of the litigators did not belong to litigation spaces, but they didn't have understanding of what needs to be done alternatively. And even for judges, they were trained differently. So there is a huge push in judicial training to understand that what the sustainable problem solving looks like and how to facilitate conversations between the parties that would allow them to see each other's perspective so that a judge does not have to impose the decision on them. They can come up with their own solutions with the assistance of a judge. So I know that in India as well and where I am practicing, even the role of judges has changed tremendously. They are being trained differently to see that some of the options, every case, the court appearance is not focused on either a motion or trial. There is a huge vanishing of trial aspect, if you have heard, because it's so costly and it doesn't really necessarily render the decision that's acceptable to both. And judges are understanding that. And there is a huge research that's being made on the neuropsychology, how people think, how people resolve, and why they do what they do, and what happens after the decision is being made. Because what we are looking for is what is sustainable. And the judicial system is concerned about people coming back. And they are changing the approach as well. There is a huge part of training judges to understand that their role is not only a decision maker based on the evidence presented and applying the law. There are lots of opportunities created in litigation process where you would have case conference, settlement conference, trial management conference. So the JDR or just judges led dispute resolution is a big thing that's happening all across the globe. And it's shifting the role of lawyers. It's shifting the role of judges. And, and traditionally we had seen that judges were seen to be the uh, decision makers and lawyers were seen to be the advocates. But right now, if you see who is designing the processes and who have become experts in allowing parties to resolve, they're not necessarily lawyers. There is huge shift for non-lawyers to bring their knowledge into dispute resolution. So lawyering has changed, role of various professionals have changed, and expertise of people from other areas of life and bringing a team of professionals, bringing the interdisciplinary aspect to problem solve 
all of that is happening. So I think that we have to see that the change is happening. It may not be very big and evident, but we, that's why I said we are at the crossroads. Everyone needs to adapt to the change needed because there is a push from public and there is a push from above as well so that we can all deal with the backlogs and we can actually find creative solutions that stay and sustain. Debra? Thank you, Madam. Uh, that elaborates. We, we in India always say that we have rule of law and not rule of justice. So you can't expect justice all the time. So <laughs> because it's difficult for the judges, if they have to follow rule of law and not rule of justice. Uh, Mr. Mahajan, you want to ask something? No, it's all right. Okay, Debra, so uh, I have Debra, Mr. Debra, may I ask a question to Archana Yes, Mr. yes, Mr. 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 please go ahead. So please Archana, ahead. My, my question is a very different. I'd like to know what is the charges of a mediator in Ontario, in Canada, where you live? What is the professional charges that you as a mediator and a good quality mediator would charge for a mediation system? And this is for the benefit of all of us, because at the end of the day, if this is not going to be a revenue case in terms of, this is not a pro bono activity always. We won't get good quality of mediators if we don't have a proper system or uh, enough, uh, enough, uh, you know, uh, uh, revenue coming in or, or uh, the payments to a mediator. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's a very hands-on practical question and I'll approach it. I think that uh, kind of is augmenting what was the question of Mr. Mahajan? People who do not have financial resources, where are they going? And can they actually afford these services? So what's happening in Ontario and how people are paying for it is in two streams. One is a private stream uh, where people are paying privately based on the, their retainers. But then there is another stream, which is public stream. And that is the ministry run court connected ministry funded programs. And they use the cost grid, which is based on people's income and dependence. And it could be as uh, small a hourly rate as $5 for someone who lives on minimum wage. And, and it is shifting the grounds because everyone gets to have at least up to six hours of mediation, which is on site of the courts with excellent trained mediators who specialize into various aspects of dispute resolution. So Thank I think so I, I've about, answered. And, yeah, and what about the private mediation? What are the charges there, if you may, if I, if I can understand? Well, that depends. That depends on what the ability of the parties are. And usually, if there is a private mediation, people are actually focusing on something hybrid. There is a huge shift of using MEDAR in, in North America, where I am. Uh, where people would have a retainer agreement. I mean, I'm not going into the monetary aspects of it because it changes depending on the type of dispute and the ability of the parties to pay. But if the parties want to work with a mediator, uh, they would start with mediation. If the mediation is not successful, they shift into the evaluative mode of arbitration. So the hybrid process of MedARB is being used as an alternative to litigation and and that's a huge shift happening at this point in time as well thank you so much Ashton. thank you thank you uh, thank you ma'am uh, there's one question from miss uh, sneha shwet uh, his questions uh, he's there are two questions actually connected questions one is this that you have he says you have highlighted culture as an entity in the process of adr what checks and balances could be as budding mediators need to be aware of the impact in the bracket, positive or negative, of cross-culture in modern day mediations? Now, the connected question number two is this, how, how far ADR is capable in addressing the issues involved in immigration issues? So it's very interesting question because uh, my interests have deepened into understanding the impact of culture, particularly uh, understanding cross-cultural conflict. And 
sometimes culture decides even what we wear and how we speak and what we think. It's really deep. And it includes the way people feel that, that their need, uh, needs are being met in dispute resolution. What they imagine, what they think of one another. And most of the cultures are, are the ones who would understand the needs of parties based on their socialization. So it's really important where you are working with diverse cultures, people coming from different cultures and coming to Canada, which is a multicultural society, you would be dealing with people who bring lots of identities at the table. As I said, one person can have different cultural identities within themselves and then two parties who come from different parts of the world and have come to a point of adopting and changing to a certain extent and holding on to their other cultural values, it's a process. So as a mediator, I think we have to understand the concept of tolerance and acceptance of diversity. And that's where the, the framework of intersectionality is very useful, particularly when there is immigration issues as the question is, it brings a lot of vulnerability for the people and understanding what is shifting because of their identities and power or power imbalances sometimes is crucial for a mediator to understand. Because if you do that, then you know how to design the process. In mediation, we are the definers of the process. We design the process. If we don't understand the needs of the parties, the process that we designed is not going to work. So I think that understanding that no culture is superior to one or another is, is important. And culture allows us, and, and the skillful mediator would allow us to move those barriers in a way that would really make it complex for people I, I always say that for complex problems, the process has to be complex enough. If you bring simplistic solutions, they won't stick. You have to give people enough to go through various stages of naming, claiming, and then resolving. And, and there is neuroscience which talks about, and, and there is a wonderful book uh, on conflict resolution, um, called Brain Fishing. I, I would encourage all of you to look at that book. It's wonderful. And it actually uh, makes the brain science very simple. It says that we have two uh, types of brains. One is blue brain and the other is red brain, just to make it simple, not scientific way of looking at it. So red brain is something which, uh, which is our fight and uh, flight response. Sometimes what we have trained ourselves, if I'm driving a car, sometimes I would put the keys and I would drive home, not even knowing that I'm driving because it's so much ingrained in us. That's red brain doing it. If we are fighting, if the parties on your mediation table are engaged in conflict, they're using their red brain. You have to consciously focus on bringing them to the brain, which is called as blue brain, to make them think objectively in a calm manner. And it's really important to allow them to have that mental space, their brain functioning in a way that they are not giving fight or flight response. And as a skillful mediator, you need to understand this neuropsychology. When people are fighting, when they are venting, you don't interrupt them, allow them to say what they wanted to say, and then bring the positivity. There are ways, as, as we call it, as upward spiral. How do you bring the upward spiral? Allow one party to say something positive. So ask questions in a way consciously that brings positivity on your mediation table. And once there is a positivity on one small thing, you will build further on that. Imagine a cone-like situation where you're actually bringing that positivity and it goes up, it becomes more and wider, and then it consumes the whole process of being positive. 
And of course, inverse to that is negative. If that doesn't happen, then the mediation sinks because people's emotions take it away. So as a skillful mediator, if we understand the cultural triggers of the parties or even ourselves, which sometimes are biases that kick in for all of us, how we understand and not stereotype people's uh, perspectives of dispute, how they are defining it, so giving them space. And that's where basically giving that fundamental understanding of culture and bringing that humility as a mediator is crucial. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Is anybody trying to uh, ask something? No. So there's one question. Uh, this is about our Indian Penal Court from India. Uh, the uh, Shalini Mishra is asking, she is asking that can ADR mechanism be applied to offenses in IPC that are compoundable at the hands of the party, Indian Penal Court? Okay, I think I should pass that question on to someone who is working in the jurisdiction. Uh, yeah. It's been a long time that I have left India, so I don't want to make yeah. comments no, but on what something she, very what specific. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. What she wanted to ask. Uh, that if the uh, if the, the, there are offenses which are compoundable, can you introduce ADR in that? So I think that is the question which she wanted to ask. I mean, I I also don't have the answer. So I'll just uh, go to the another question from Mr. T. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, can I? Uh, yeah, please, please do. I'm Kavita Bhatia, uh, teaching uh, ADR uh, at Faculty of Law, the Maharaja Sahajrao University of Baroda. Uh, for compoundable uh, offenses, actually, as such in India, uh, uh, like Negotiable Instrument Act, wherein uh, though it is uh, uh, though it is a criminal uh, liability against the person whosoever has not paid the uh, uh, paid the amount uh, which is there in the check, but then uh, again uh, with the mutual consent of the parties, uh, they may uh, approach any of the suitable uh, ADR. So uh, that is the scenario uh, in India we may consider for... Uh, yeah, but uh, that is about NIA Act. That is not IPC. So I think uh, that was uh, about only specifically about IPC. Okay. So I have one question from... Devrat, I'd, like, about... Devrat I'd like to answer. Devrat, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Go ahead. See, um, in India... There are offenses which are compoundable. Uh, Your voice is not very clear, sir, Mr. Khanna. Saying, uh, in India, where uh, you see uh, there are offenses which are compoundable. Yes. And uh, certainly those offenses which are compoundable can always be referred for mediation. Uh, most of us, uh, as mediators in Supreme Court, have been assigned cases especially in matrimonial disputes where you see the parties also have been, uh, you know, uh, started the uh, criminal cases against each other. So we do, uh, you see, uh, when we are compromising, uh, the parties are uh, coming to settlement, we do settle those cases also and parties agree to withdraw those cases and uh, not to, you see, proceed with those criminal cases also. So certainly, even the criminal cases, especially compoundable, definitely can be referred for uh, 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 mediation. Uh, we have applied this uh, also in motor vehicle accident cases. In motor vehicle accident cases also, when the criminal liability is there, parties do agree and they compound those and uh, they cooperate and uh, settle the matters. So uh, this practice is being followed and the cases in mediation are getting settled, even relating to the IPC offenses. Uh, Devrat, I just, uh, I just, thank you, uh, Rakesh ji. Just I'll add one thing uh, to that. Uh, with regard to the Supreme Court's role in uh, allowing mediation, even in an offenses, uh, if you know that one are compoundable, compoundable are absolutely, uh, mediation can always happen but slightly at a stage which are mixed uh, offenses, which are some of them are compoundable, some are non-compoundable. Supreme Court is permitting 
settlement and if settlement arises and in that case uh, offenses which are non compoundable those offenses are quashed fir is quashed with a miss those offenses so supreme court is very open to it uh, coming up very openly even uh, people have got experience we we'll leave the little in other way but i just uh, another session but i just don't, don't want to take much of the time but supreme court is very open even in non compoundable cases thank you mr sharma and uh, mr khanna for that answer the, the one question of mr from mr rama subramaniam is this that kindly advise on the overlap between commercial and conventional mediation madam would you like to take that question so i would approach it on a very umbrella um, overview aspect of it and that's one thing that i think that we are all seeing that there are conventional ways of resolving disputes either in commercial spaces or otherwise in in many other aspects of it and there is a change happening where the process is shifting which mixes and matches various tools so even in commercial spaces which are governed by a lot of times various uh, instruments if they are international trades and other types then there are many other parameters where people are bound by some of the things when they participate in the processes it's not just the open choice between what the parties decide and sometimes there could be institutional uh, parties involved not individuals which again is a whole lot aspect of organization or institution participating as a party and it could be a mix and match so the key, the key aspect for us is to and the the core thing that i want to look at in the history of how even the commercial disputes were resolved and how we have to do it now because there is a push people are ag agreeing even the international uh, agreements and and the impact of the singapore convention and the changes being brought is huge there are jurisdiction aspects which are key uh, to understanding so of course that needs to be kept so there is certain framework in commercial disputes that needs to be addressed it cannot be open uh, in in sense of parties choosing what they really want but what they can choose is how they resolve their disputes within that framework which they have to follow which there are contracts there are implications of that there are aspects of damages there are aspects of as in criminal aspect there could be injuries so looking at it in terms of dollar values and and liability aspects which are huge in commercial uh, disputes we are trying to move it out of litigation for and we are trying to bring it in arena of consensus building and that's where we are looking at how to make it human centric how to make it people centric and how to allow the voices of people and how to balance the power because if there is a huge corporation at one hand and there is an individual on the other there would be a power imbalance so it doesn't change the core of it doesn't change as a mediator or mediator arbitrator if that's the process you are in to understand how to balance that power how to agree to the parties so how do you conduct the pre mediation what is your retainer what's the scope of uh your role that you are going to define all of that needs to be considered because what happens in the court system which is simple that's why people tend to go there because it's defined one party files uh the uh, the suit whatever you call in your jurisdiction the other party responds then there are court appearances and if it doesn't resolve at various stages and motions and hearings then it would go for trial there is a defined path for uh designing justice in that but what we are trying to do is bring it outside of that because there is a backlog there is a clogging and there are certain challenges that i have reviewed very briefly in the presentation today 
people's emotions, their core uh, understanding of why the dispute is uh, the dispute or how to name it is not necessarily sitting well with that framework. So even for the commercial disputes, when you're trying to bring it out, now you are the designer. You don't have that structure which is ready-made for you. So use it creatively in a way that would give the space to the parties to understand each other, to, to hear each other, to define their problem, to find what's common in their understanding what the problem is to start with. And how do you do that? How you modify the processes? Do you make them sit together? Do you do it the shuttle way? How do you handle the impasse? That's where our skill as process designer comes in. And it's true for any mediation, but so as commercial as well, because there is a huge power imbalance in commercial mediations, given the institutional setups. And particularly the most challenging ones are where there are interjurisdictional challenges uh, involved. And, and there are cultural aspects of people who are parties to that uh, process. And they are going to bring in their own values and cultures and how they dispute and how they resolve. So you have to be mindful of focusing on their needs of defining what's the dispute and designing how the process would work and allowing them space to come up with their own resolution. So whether it's commercial or other, the core concepts or values would not change. Dispute resolution, the fundamentals remain the same. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, nice answer, madam. Uh, Mr. Rajput, would you like to ask something? You have raised your hand. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Devar. Uh, yeah. I have a very uh, different kind of question out here. Because some of our friends, when we are discussing about mediation as such, uh, some people said that mediators are manipulators. So I disagreed with them because a lot of people take manipulation as a negative word. I strongly believe manipulation need not be negative in all the aspects. Uh, my concern out here is, uh, is there any ethical way of uh, manipulation? Or should, should I say, uh, uh, people are saying that, okay, uh, we try to give direction to the minds of the parties to, for them to make them understand their own positions and then come out with their own solutions. So it's kind of a manipulation. So can you put in some light on this manipulation versus mediators and all this aspects? Okay, so I think that uh, sometimes the language we use connotes what's happening as well. So we have to choose our words carefully. So I think that manipulation is a word which is quite well understood, that there is a negative aspect of manipulating. And of course, there is no space for either positive or negative manipulation in a process that's open and for self-determination of the parties. How do you present it, of course, is up to your personal choices but it's not that you are manipulating the parties and that's where you are going to have next few sessions uh, where the role of a mediator and power of mediator would be discussed. We as mediators bring power. Although we are not judges, there is a lot that we bring in. We have power to terminate. We can tell the parties that, okay, you have right of self-determination, but if I sense that this is not appropriate case for mediation, I can walk out and that's our power. So identifying that and making the parties understand what we call as BATNA and WATNA. Uh, you might have heard about these concepts. BATNA is better alternative to a negotiated agreement. And WATNA is the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. Sometimes parties know what their options are. They know what their positions are. They know what their interests are. So the, the key principal aspect as a mediator is peeling the conflict onion. Slowly you are actually understanding their positions and going deeper into their interests. Focus their minds on understanding each other's positions in the sense of the conflict, 
the root cause of it. So you are not really manipulating them. You are allowing them to listen to the others, even understand what they're saying, what their story is, what their narration is, how they're saying it. And ultimately let them decide if that's where the truth is. Because everyone has their own truth. Everyone has their own understanding. And there are some people who can narrate their uh, concerns in a very effective manner and some may not. And it could bring power imbalance. Some people could be very charming and some are not. And as a mediator, are you being swayed? And of course, as, as a mediator, you cannot be biased because once you are biased, either conscious or unconscious biases kick in, the integrity of, of your process is not there anymore. So I think that as a facilitator and an objective part of it, but not participating in it. I always say that you have to be empathetic, not sympathetic, but the best part of us could be being attuned to the needs of the parties. So you are aloof, but you are not indifferent. So I, I think I would like to summarize, Mr. Rajput, that we are not really manipulating the parties. We are educating them to see the problem and see where they see the solution of their own problems. Thank, thank you. you. I, I believe I'm in the right direction then. I thank you for the, the absolute uh, perfect way of giving me the that my direction is good. Thank you. Thank you. Now thank we you. have come to the last question now. Uh, this is from Mr. T.R. Aurora. He says that I'm a non-legal technocrat who is a novice in mediation process. So he just wanted to ask whether there are any compilation of ADR cases available to develop a comprehensive understanding. So it's interesting uh, question in a way, because I think we lump ADR into a word which is composed of various processes and which includes mediation, which is of course a closed process. Most of the times it's not reported. Arbitration on the other hand is of course a private judge deciding for the parties because the parties have agreed to it. And then the parties define what's the scope of dispute and what are the powers to the arbitrator. And the decisions or awards are then scrutinized by uh, the courts in turn. So there is reporting of those scrutiny available, but most of the times people are choosing those because there is different way of handling those disputes. Um, so you would see a compilation of cases which is focused on where there has been formal scrutiny, but the other processes are closed. <clears throat> there is no public reporting on those. And that sometimes is the concern about ADR that we don't know what's happening within those closed doors. When we say people are satisfied, was it one party giving in? And that's why I think it's really crucial and ethical responsibility of the mediators to balance the power, to make sure that if the power is not balanced and one party is giving in and you can clearly see that, that's a challenge. So the compilation of various aspects is available if you are interested in uh, some of the readings, particularly focused on North America, you can connect with me offline. I'll be happy to share some of the resources with you. Thank you very much, madam. And thank you for all the answers which we have taken, all the questions that we have taken and such a detailed answer that we have given. Uh, it is time for the closing address of Mr. Mahajan. Uh, uh, before calling him, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Mahajan, who is a veteran at the Supreme Court of India. He's been a vibrant journalist, reporter, author, and also a teacher of law, besides being a lawyer and a mediator. Uh, when I say teacher of law, Mr. Mahajan has been a dean faculty of law in a couple of universities. Uh, he's, uh, if I say that he's a complete lawyer and a uh, very valuable asset in mediation. Uh, 
success here in Delhi. Mr. Majid. Yeah, Deborah, thank you very much. Uh, the, I, I think I should take very little time because uh, we have really crossed the limit. <clears throat> the uh, proceedings today started with uh, Debra uh, beautifully outlining the evolution of the Indian system uh, from uh, the Bengal regulation, regula regulation under the British through Mahatma Gandhi down to the Legal Services Act and down to the mediation process as it exists today in terms of court annexed mediation. Part uh, of that, uh, as Mr. Devrath uh, outlined what basically is the rigid uh, framework of, uh, of litigation and mediation today in India, the, our uh, learned uh, guest speaker, uh, Archana Medhikar, she uh, immediately uh, started, she immediately came to the cultural aspect and what I may say the emotional quotient of mediation. And this emotional quotient is what is normally not taken into account. And this emotional quotient is what gives mediation in a sense a march of over the traditional uh, litigation. And uh, because mediation gives, as she said, inclusiveness, belonging, and dignity, including it takes into account transaction costs, which uh, the rigid framework of litigation does not normally take into account. So therefore, there is a change which is taking place all over the world, along with the, the technology of delivery of uh, of uh, conflict resolution. And this change is that uh, there is a flexibility which is being demanded for different kinds of disputes and different kinds of situations. And this flexibility is what mediation gives. And media mediators as designers, as designers of solutions to conflicts is a challenging role full of opportunities and that is why she, uh, right at the beginning, gave us that four learning values are there in what she would, what she she was she had outlined, and this was the courage to take risks, that is, open minds to be able to take risks, the curiosity to open opportunities, the learning therefrom which must be applied to personal life, and that is very crucial. So she placed human beings at the center of the whole process and to look not at the case, but at the human being who is in conflict and to reflect and understand. That is the fourth value, reflecting and understanding and not like uh, all of us know as lawyers, uh, we finish the case and that's it, that's the end of it. After that, the file is closed and uh, for us, it doesn't exist anymore. So, because reflection and understanding is what give, leads to what she again pointed out and emphasized, user experience and feedback. And therefore you use that user experience and feedback to enrich the process of conflict resolution. So there is a constant process of learning and relearning in mediation for the mediator and for the others involved in that resolution process. <clears throat> we uh, were happy to uh, know about Ken Cloak, uh, her guru, as she said, and uh, it was nice. So thank you, Archanaji, for uh, introducing us to introducing Ken Cloak to us. And uh, the basic uh, uh, the basic uh, factors on which the whole process moves have always been the same, power, interests, and the solution to the conflict between power and interests. The cultural context is what she emphasized. And she said, the cultural context in terms of values has not really changed. And probably that's true. Impartiality, neutrality, non-bias, and fairness. And uh, therefore, the as she so beautifully put it, she said, we face such a range of cultural contexts from saris, samosas, and tablas 
to manner of problems, uh, to uh, solving problems in family, to modern forms of problem solving organizations. And therefore she, she said, it's all about naming, framing, claiming, and taming. And taming is what she introduced. And I guess uh, she meant uh, that the wild beast in human beings, which leads to all kinds of problems, uh, probably mediation in a sense tames, or largely not only mediation, but medar, the larger uh, process, the totality of process. And uh, that's why she was uh, right in saying that uh, there is a fluidity. There is a fluidity in the, in the, in the kinds of methods of what is called ADR used according to the cultural context, according to the, the kind of conflict that you are dealing with, according to the parties that you are dealing with. And this fluidity has in turn resulted in a change of the kind of lawyers and the kind of litigation processes and the court processes of uh, conferences prior to the litigation, settlement processes, et cetera. So there is, there is a whole sea of change which is, which is uh, taking over, the, which has taken over actually, the conflict resolution process all over the world. Uh, this uh, sea of change, I guess, uh, like uh, development, uh, is, uh, is, is going to make very slow uh, introduction into, into the developing countries like us. And uh, it will take quite some time to change this whole ingrained system of hundreds of years of uh, British colonial practice. <clears throat> for many reasons, for all of us know that uh, it is entrenched and why it is entrenched, the revenue behind it, et cetera. The, uh, the focus on human beings led me to uh, think that for thousands of years, we have had the Patanjali's Ashtang Yoga. And Patanjali's Ashtang Yoga talks precisely about this, the body-mind the body-mind fusion towards being a better human being. Towards, so therefore the focus is on the individual. As an individual, if you choose to improve yourself, then the conflict resolution becomes easier. And that is why I think these eight processes of Ashtang Yoga could be the Ashtang Yoga of mediation. One is attitude. Anger, hate, ill will, posture, that is the way you sit and the way you stand and the way you talk and the, 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 the breathing. I have observed in mediation that observing the breathing process of those who come for settlement or those who come to resolve the conflict uh, helps a lot in understanding how agitated the party is how agitated the party is. Then the awareness of self. Third is physical, uh, the physical part. The fourth is the attachment to what and why. Why are the parties attached to what they are saying? And why are they attached? Then touching their conscience. You see, touching one's own conscience. And that is why what Archana Ji has said about uh, applying the learning to personal life applying to learning learning so that the mediator himself or herself is evolving by applying that learning and that experience. And the last is a very uh, powerful word is samadhi. And samadhi is enlightenment. And that is what we move to through the process of mediation. You move to enlightenment of yourself, you move to enlightening the parties and the parties are made to understand that look, it is better to resolve it peacefully rather than to go through the normal processes of resolution through the courts and the transaction costs involved. So <clears throat> I think we have, had a, we have had an extremely rich session about culture. And incidentally, uh, culture is one of the fundamental rights in the Indian constitution. We have ignored it by and large. 
but uh, it is a fundamental right and there are very few constitutions which take culture as a fundamental right and uh, of course uh, to enforce culture in india you, people can go straight to the supreme court so we probably have to wait for a creative uh, uh, creative conflict where the culture of conflict can be taken to the supreme court because the, the india is full of alternative ways of it those of us who work in the villages with the law not remain confined to, confined to the courts and certainly not to the supreme court uh, there are pani adalats farmers resolve their problems of irrigation and water sharing through their local meetings and they, and these are recorded incidentally these are available the pani adalat conferences are the the meetings are available and how they are done how they are organized and uh, they are resolved on the spot instantaneously because you can't wait for water to keep uh, to, to to for the resolution of a conflict to for the water to come and the meanwhile what happens to the plants especially in summer so there are there is a whole field which uh, which our uh, learned uh, guest speaker has opened up for us in india and this whole field is of mapping of mapping this these cultural movements uh, which have existed for thousands of years in our villages in india and saying that these these are available unfortunately these are little known and uh, certainly very little known in the courts and lesser known amongst our bar associations and uh, organizations of lawyers uh i think nevaran has done a wonderful job of uh, asking archana ji to come here and enlighten all of us on the cultural aspect the emotional aspect the learning processes involved and therefore the i think we go back much better human beings thanks to archana ji thank you very much archana <clears throat> devrat please thank you thank you sir right thank you sir for chartana ji for your time thank you mr mahan thank you everyone thank you mr santan thank you uh the nivaran team mr uh, mr rakesh khanna mr jm uh, sharma madam thank you very much uh, this brings to the end of uh, this series i mean this uh, today's lecture of course we'll meet tomorrow we we'll continue to Thank you so much, sir. Really, really nice session. Thank you, Arshad. And thank, thank you, you Rahul.